Welcome to lecture 2.6, Propositions over a Universe. Let's start with a definition. Let U be a non-empty set. Think like the real numbers or the rational numbers or the integers. A proposition over U is a sentence that contains a variable that can take on any value in U and that has a definite truth value as a result of any such substitution. We may write something like p of u to denote the truth value of p when we substitute in u. Here are some examples. First of all, over the integers, consider the sentence x squared is greater than or equal to 0. This, if we substitute any integer for x, this is always true. So it's not just a proposition over the integers, but it is a tautology over the integers. The second one, x is greater than or equal to 0. Now this is not always true over the integers, but it's either always true or always false. So it is still a proposition over the integers, but it's just sometimes true. Finally, consider the sentence x squared is less than 0. This is never true over the integers. So it is a contradiction. However, it's still a proposition over the integers because all, all that we require is that any value, any integer has a definite truth value as a result of any such substitution. And yes, the truth value in this case is false. So something that would be a, a non-example is something like x plus 2. If we were to substitute in an integer, it doesn't makes sense to call such a substitution true or false. So this is not a proposition over the integers. Our second example is over the rational numbers, that is the set of all fractions. So consider the following statement, s minus 1 times s plus 1 equals s squared minus 1. That is certainly true for all rational numbers. So in particular, it has a definite truth value, true or false, it's always true. So it is moreover a tautology. Our second statement is 4x squared minus 3x equals 0. Now let's, let's factor that. So that is, you don't have to factor, but we'll do it anyways. x times 4x minus 3 equals 0. So this is only true if x equals 0 or x equals 3, 3 fourths. So it's true in these two cases and it's false in all of the other cases. So it has a definite truth value as a result of any substitution of a rational number. So this is a proposition over u. It is neither a tautology nor a contradiction because it is not always true or always false. Finally, the last statement is y squared equals two. Now I'm gonna ask you to believe me, something we will prove later in the class, fairly soon, that the square root of 2 is not a rational number. In other words, we cannot write the square root of 2 as a quotient of two integers. So if you believe me there, then y squared is never going to be equal to 2 for any rational number. So this is a statement that is false for all rational numbers y. So in other words, it has a definite truth value as a result of any such substitution. That truth value is false. That said, it is still a proposition over u. It just happens to be a contradiction, always false. Our third example is a little more abstract. Our universe is no longer just a set of numbers like the integers or the rationals, but rather it is a collection of subsets of a fixed set S. So S could be it could have three elements or it could have infinitely many. I don't care as long as we, if we fix S and consider the set of subsets. So our first example within this one is the following statement. A is non-empty or A is not the entire set. So this is something that we can ask and, and an arbitrary subset is either going to be true or false. So A, a subset A, well this, this statement is going to be true if it's not if it's not empty and not the entire thing. So we say if it's a non-empty, non-proper subset, it will be true. However, if A is empty or if A is all of S, then this thing is 
is false. So this is an example of a proposition over the power set of S because for any A, it's either true or false. Next, we can ask if the element 3 is in A. That statement is either true or it's false for any subset A. And it doesn't matter whether 3 is, is in the set S or if 3 is not in the set S, then it's going to always be false. And finally, the statement A intersect the set containing 1, 2, and 3 is non-empty. In other words, none of these elements is contained in A. That is also a statement that is either true or false for any fixed subset. So all of these things, these things are examples of propositions over the power set of S. Finally, let me conclude with a non-example. So let's write down any expression that you know, we can plug in for a subset, but it's not necessarily true or false. So, so what about something like A intersect 1, 2, or 3? So we, we can certainly compute this for any subset A, but it's, it doesn't make sense to say that this is either true or false. It's just it's a statement it doesn't necessarily have it doesn't have a true or false value. Before we move on, I want to actually add an example that I don't have in the slide. I just thought of it. I don't have room anyways. But I'll give you an example of something that's a proposition over one universe, but not over a big universe or a bigger universe. So consider the statement um, well over the real numbers. I can say x is is bigger than zero. That's a statement that that's either true or false for any real number. However, over the complex numbers, this need not be true or false. And it's a technical reason that complex numbers, it's not obvious, are is not well ordered. So i, which is the square root of negative one, it is not true that that is, it, it's not bigger than zero or it's not less than zero because we can't define an ordering in the complex numbers that has the property that an ordering would want. Now, just the heck of it, what is that property? Well, um, it has to satisfy certain obvious conditions. So if, if A is less than B, then it must be the case that A plus anything C has to be less than A Sorry, then and B plus C, right? So if A is less than B, then we should be able to add anything to both sides and preserve that property. And also, similarly, if uh, uh, the next property we need is that if 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 uh, A is is bigger than zero, and if B is bigger than zero, then A times B has has to be bigger than zero as well. So it turns out it's very non-trivial that it is not possible to, to order the complex numbers so these things hold. So this statement here, this is a, is a proposition over the real numbers, but it is not a proposition over the complex numbers. I think that's an important example because un unlike these things, here... Whether this is a proposition depends on what our universe is. Let's take a few moments to recall the laws of logic that we've studied. So a proposition is any sentence which is either true or false. And we use logical variables as placeholders for propositions, just like how in algebra we use regular variables for placeholders for numbers. And then we built up logic using and, or, and not, and truth tables. So all of these laws of logic are still valid for propositions over a universe. For example, if P and Q are propositions over the integers Z, then P and Q implies Q. And let's recall why this is true. Well, there's two ways I'll explain it. One of them is it just makes sense that if P and Q are both true, then Q has to be true. But more fundamentally, it's because 
if P and Q, then Q is a tautology. And we have rules for that. Let's just refresh our memory what, that, what those are like. So let's write down P, Q, P and Q, and if P, then Q. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So P and Q, 0, 0, 0, 1. If P, then Q. So that is 1, 1, 0, 1. Remember that. And finally, P and Q implies Q. So we're asking when P and Q implies Q. So in other words, in this case, when does 0... So 0 implies 0. That is, is true. 0 implies 1. That is true. Again, 0 implies 1 is true. Next, we have 0 implies 0. That, that is always true. And 1 implies 1 is true. So that lines up. Since this is all 1s, that is a tautology. And that's logically, mathematically, why, why this is true. Now, I want to point out a, a careful distinction. I said above that all of the laws of logic that we've seen so far are valid for propositions over a universe. That said, for specific propositions, more might be true. So as an example of this, over the integers, consider the following two simple propositions. So let P be the proposition that says an integer n is less than 44. So P is true if n is less than 44 and false otherwise. And let, let Q be the proposition that says n is less than 16. So Q is true whenever n is less than 16 and false otherwise. Football fans may recognize these numbers 44 and 16 as, as not being particularly random due to a uh, recent football victory at my institution. But uh, moving on. Um, so we can write these in, in this in concise notation. So P of n is true if n is less than 44. Q of n is true if less, n is less than 16. Now in this case, Q implies P and Q. So this is normally not true in logic, because if P is true, that does not necessarily imply that both P and Q are true, because P could be false. But for this particular case, it is true, because it's impossible for P to be false if, if Q is true. So let's check that two different ways. So if Q is true, that means N is less than 16. So if n is less than 16, then n has to be less than 44 as well. So n is less than 44 and then is less than 16. So this checks out. Let's check it with the truth table. So we have p, we have q. Um, we have p and q. Let's re recall what p implies q is because we'll be doing q implies p and q. So 0, 0. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, so P and Q, 0, 0, 0, 1. P implies Q um, is 1, 1, 0, 1. And so now what about this? What about Q implies P and Q? So in that case, 0 implies 0 is 1. 1 implies 1 is 1, 0 implies 0 is 1, and 1 implies 0, that is 0. So while it seems like this is not going to be a tautology, notice that it is impossible for P to be false and Q to be true. You know, P being false means N is bigger than 40, or N is at least 44. And if N is at least 44, then there's no way this is true and can't be less than 16. So more accurately, what we should be doing is we should just be eliminating this case altogether. Oh, not sorry, not this case. This case, if we eliminate that altogether, then the remain the, the remaining entries are one. So this is a tautology if we ignore the case that can never happen. So that that's the truth table interpretation of why something like this can hold. Here is a convenient definition to introduce. If P is a proposition over a universe U, then the truth set of P is the following set. It's the 
subset of elements in U for which P of A is true. In other words, when you plug them into the proposition P or substitute, the result is true. When P is an equation, we often just use the term solution set instead of truth set. These are things that you've seen before, but you've probably never seen them formalized. Here are some examples. Suppose S is the set containing the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, and U, the universe, is a set of all subsets. Then the truth set of the following proposition, the subset 1 and 2 intersect with A is non-empty, over U, well, this is just the collection, of sub, it's a collection of subsets for which this statement is true. So it's a collection of subsets that don't contain 1 or 2. So it's the empty set, the set containing just 3, the set containing 4, and the set containing 3 and 4. These are precisely the subsets of S for which their intersection of, with 1 and 2 is empty. Here's an example that we've seen before. So over the integers, the truth or the solution set of the following equation, 4x squared minus 3x equals 0, well, the only integer solution of this is 0. So this is not the empty set. This is the set containing the number 0. However, over the rational numbers, the solution set of the same equation, the same statement, 4x squared minus 3x equals 0 has two elements, because recall that this thing factors as x times 4x minus 3 equals 0, so x can be 0, or over the rational numbers, x can be 3 quarters. But we can't say that this is possible over the integers, because that is, is not, an, it's not an element of the integers. So the solution or the truth set depends on not just the, the expression, the sentence, or the equation here, but also on the universe that we're working over. On the previous slide, we introduced the notion of a truth set of a single proposition P. We called it T sub P. Um, we can also talk about the truth set of compound propositions, things like the truth set of P and Q, or P or Q. These can always be expressed in terms of the truth sets of simple propositions, things like TP and TQ individually. Let's see an example. By definition, an element A is in the truth set of P and Q if and only if A, plugging in A, makes P and Q true. Of course, this holds if and only if A makes both P and Q and Q true. And this is equivalent to A being in TP and TQ, or equivalently, the intersection of TP and TQ. Formally, we say that the truth set of P and Q is just the intersection of TP and TQ. And we can do this for other basic compound statements as well. The truth set of P or Q is just the union of the truth sets of P and of Q. The truth set of not P is just the complement of the truth set of P. Now the next two are a little more complicated. The truth set of the biconditional operator is well, it's the union of the intersection of the truth sets with the intersection of the complements. So remember, this is true if and only if P and Q have the same value, so they're either both true or both false. And finally, the truth set of if P then Q, the conditional operator, is the union of the complement of P and Q. So maybe that's not obvious. Let me draw some pictures to help better understand this. So I'm going to draw actually five pictures here. So this is the universe. This is the truth set of P. And this is the truth set of, of Q. Maybe I'll draw that a little better over here. 
draw these two circles. So this is a truth set of P, or I'll label them better. This is a set of Q. Um, this third one, let me draw it over here. This one only involves P. So I will just draw the truth set of P. And I'm going to draw two more pictures of, of this. So this is TP. This is TQ. And finally, I'll draw that picture again. TP and TQ. That's supposed to be a closed circle. Okay, let's start out with the first one. The truth set of P and Q. So that is the set of all elements in the universe that when you plug them into the proposition P and Q, it's true. So that means that it has to make P true and it has to make Q true. So it has to be in the intersection of these two truth sets. So that's everything in here. Okay, next. The truth set of P or Q is a set of all things in the universe that when you plug them into P or Q, you get true. So anything that makes P true or makes Q true is going to make that work. So that's going to be the, the union. Oh, I'm using my wrong pen. It's going to be the, the union of these two sets, which is it's hard to draw this is that. So anything in this shaded region is going to make P or Q true. Next, the, uh, the true set of not P is a set of all things in, in my universe that make P false. So that those are things that are in the complement of the true set of P. So I'm going to use a different color because otherwise you might not be able to see it. Oops, I'm using my wrong, wrong pen again. So here we go. It's, this is harder than I, I thought it would be. So that's so um, true set of not p is just the shaded region. Now here are the harder ones that are maybe a little bit harder to visualize. So t or sorry, the truth set of p if and only if q, the biconditional operator, is a set of all things that when you all things in the universe that when you plug it into into this operation, um, you get true. And that happens if and only if P and Q have the same value. So that means that either they are both true, which is this region in here, or they are both false. And that's this region, also going to be hard to draw perfectly, but this region out here. So it's the union of these two regions. Okay, finally, the truth set of the conditional operator, if P then Q, is, well, to, to see this, maybe here we need to go back to the uh, truth table, P, Q, P, and Q, you should know this by now, zero, 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 one, one zero one one. So if P then Q, that's one one zero one. So elements that are in neither P nor Q are going to make the statement true. So that corresponds to this green region out here. So this so this corresponds to, to this line. And then elements that are not in P, but in that make P tr false and Q true, that will return one. So let me uh, let me highlight that. So things that are um, let's see. So so they are not in TP, but they are in TQ. So what region is that? So that's that is this region right here. And now this next line, we don't want to highlight this because that's that's a zero. But finally, the last one is if if P and Q are both, if our element in the universe makes P and Q both true, then 
this, this is true. So the true set will also contain this region right here. So the true set is everything that is, is shaded. And that's exactly what this is. This is the, the complement of TP, the complement of this, which is, which, is every, which is the red and green region, with TQ, which is the red and blue region. So it's everything that's shaded. I should probably conclude this slide by saying that hopefully I've convinced you of all of these equalities. And I've done it with a picture. Now that is not a formal proof. And we will see many examples of when proof by pictures don't work because the picture that we draw is not general enough. So later in this class, we will see how to formally prove that two things like the two sets are equal. And, and let me just give you a preview. So if you want to prove that, that this set is equal to that set, what we, what we can do is we can take an arbitrary element in, in the left-hand side and show that it is also in the right-hand side. So if we do that, then that will that will confirm that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side. And then conversely, if we take an arbitrary element in the, the right-hand side and we show that it has to be in the left-hand side, then that will confirm the other containment. And if we have both of these containments, then equality has to hold. So that is a technique that we will see shortly and we'll practice it. But for right now, hopefully my, my proof by picture is though not a logical proof, it is a convincing argument and, and that you believe that these things are all true. We'll conclude this lecture with the notion of equivalence and implication over a universe. So two propositions, P and Q, are equivalent over U if, I should probably technically say if and only if, or the definition, if the statement P if and only if Q is a tautology. Equivalently, this just means that the truth sets are the same. You know, element is in makes P true if and only if it makes Q true. Let's do some examples. First of all, the following two statements, x squared equals 4 and x equals 2, these are equivalent over the natural numbers. However, they are not equivalent over the integers, because over the natural numbers, over the natural numbers, the truth set of both of these is just the element of the number two. It's the only natural number that whose square is four, and obviously the only natural number that is equal to two. However, over z, the truth set of p of the first one is 2 and negative 2, and the truth set of q, obviously the only thing equal to, to 2, is 2 itself. So equivalence depends on the universe. Our second example is over a universe of power set. So let's take the power set of the natural numbers. So we're, we're looking at all subsets of the natural numbers. So a subset, a, intersect the set containing 4 is non-empty, that is equivalent to the number 4 being in the subset. So these are indeed equivalent propositions over this power set. It's a subtle point, but it's worth mentioning that we can even relax the condition that the universe U is a set. For example, consider the universe U of all sets. This is an object that we can talk about. However, in the beginning of the class, we discussed why the set of all sets does not exist. Remember that involved Russell's paradox, that one about the barber who shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself. So even though we can't speak of the set of all sets, we can still think of the, that thing as an object, a collection, the class of all sets or the collection of all sets. I know it sounds trivial that we're playing with, with words, but it really is important. This is a concept that we can speak of. As an explicit example, let's consider that this universe of all sets, we can speak of the following two simple propositions. 
So both of these depend on two sets, A and B. So P is true if and only if A is contained in B. And Q is true if and only if the intersection of A and B is equal to A. So while I'm not going to prove that these are the same, I will hopefully, give you, hopefully be giving you a very convincing argument of why these are true. So let's consider, suppose we have A, which is contained in B. Do you see why, if, if this holds, then A intersect B is equal to A, right? And conversely, that's the only way that that can hold. So if, if, if this is false, if we have A and we have B here, and we have things that are in A but not in B, then the intersection of A and B are, is not going to be all of A. So hopefully that's a convincing argument for you why these, these two statements are equivalent over the universe of all sets, not the set of all sets, but the universe of all sets. But again, it's not quite a formal proof. And as I said in the previous slide, um, proving that things like this are equivalent or that two sets are equal is a technique that, that we will see very shortly. Finally, we come to implication over a universe. So here's the definition. If P and Q are propositions over U, then P implies Q. If, I should again technically probably say if and only if, if P then Q, the conditional operator is a tautology. Now remember what that was from a previous slide was T, P is the complement union T, Q, and that is this shaded region right here, everything that is not in T, P, so outside of here, or is in T, Q. We'll do three examples. The first one, over the natural numbers, here are these two not-so-random numbers, again, due to uh, the Clemson University football team. Um, the first one says if, if so let's, let's be P, if N is less than or equal to 16, then N is less than or equal to 44. That makes perfect sense, right? If, and one way to see it is because the truth set of, let's call this P, TP, is the integers 0 up to 16. The truth set of Q... This one is the integer 0 up to 44. So in terms of the picture, so this has to be a tautology, which means that there ha has to be no elements in this, this region. Um, so 0, 1, 1, 1 elements in this region would be things where P is true, but Q is false. And you can see that, that, that there is, if this is TP and this is TQ, then there is nothing that is in TP, but not in, in TQ. So in this case, a, a better example of, of this would be, this is TP, and this is TQ, and then there's, there's nothing in this region um, in this picture, because everything in TP is also in TQ. Second, over the power set of the integers, so consider the set of all subsets of integers, the complement of a set equals 1 implies that the intersection of A with this two-element set is non-empty. So let's think about why that's true. So over the power set, so the complement having size 1 means that A contains every single integer except possibly one of them. If that's the case, then there's no way that it, it can exclude both 0 and 1. So if, if this holds, then A can't exclude both of these. So the intersection of A with this subset has to be non-empty. So this statement implies that statement. Finally, let's finish with that same universe over the subsets of the integers. The subset A is contained in the even integers. That implies that A intersect the odd integers is empty. Hopefully that should be clear. Now I just lied and said I would finish with that, but I want to do one more. Let's uh do one where 
the implication depends on what universe we're in. So I'm going to go back to that example that we did in, I think it was the first slide of the complex numbers. So over, over the uh, real numbers, let me think about how to do this. Um, if x is non-zero, then it is true that x squared is positive. However, over the complex numbers, if x is non-zero, then it is not necessarily true that x squared is positive. And in fact, it doesn't make, remember, it doesn't make sense to even say this as a preposition. So this statement is not well-founded because this right-hand side is, is not always true or false. So this is an example of where an implication over one universe doesn't even make sense over a bigger universe. Okay, I'm going to actually add one more to this slide again because I want to give you an example where the implication does depend on the universe, but both of these things make sense. So let me, let me move up, up here to the uh, right-hand side and think about how to do this. I'm sort of improving here. So let's see, over, over the complex numbers, if, if, if we have a polynomial, if um, f of x has, has degree bigger than, than 0, so the degree is just the coefficient of the highest term, so this is degree n, then f of x has a root has a root, right? So if you have a degree, if you have a polynomial that's non-constant over the complex numbers, it has a root. This is not true over the real numbers. So this, this is, is not true over, over the real numbers. And as a simple example, consider x squared plus 1. This has degree 2. It does not have a root in the real numbers. So this is an example where, where P, this, th this proposition P implies Q over one universe, but over a smaller universe, P does not imply Q.